Xenobiographics, mobsters. Lots of B-roll with wise guys, Cuban cigars, and their attractive girlfriends, and slicked back hair. Unfortunately, not all of us are gifted such wonderful genetics atop our heads. Fortunately, if you're someone who's worried about losing his hair, there is today's sponsor, Keeps. Did you know that two out of every three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? <laughs> Well, I definitely know it. For me, it was 25. I wish Keeps had been around when I was younger because advancements in science have meant that there are now treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss and help you keep your hair. It's too late for me. My hair's not coming back. But you don't have to be like me. You can stop your hair loss early thanks to Keeps. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved drugs for treating hair loss. So you may have tried them before, but never at a price this low. That's right. If you're thinking, oh, Simon, medicine for hair loss, it's going to be expensive. Oh no, Keep starts at just $10 a month. How does it work? Well, for one thing, there's no need to visit a doctor's office. Just schedule a quick online consult, and a bit later, boom, discreet package arrives, and inside, all the products you need to keep your hair and use them in the privacy of your own home. So if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, that's one problem that's not going to fix itself. Do something about it. For a limited time, go to keeps.com forward slash biographics, or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. He would have been chairman of the board of General Motors if he'd gone into legitimate business, is how an FBI agent once described Meyer Lansky with a note of reluctant respect in his voice. Lansky was one of the most powerful people in the mafia, even though technically he was only an associate because he was Jewish, not Italian. But most mob bosses were perfectly happy to gloss over that minor detail, because working with Lansky was an almost surefire way of making money, and all of them, above any loyalties, traditions, and beliefs, liked making money. Meyer Lansky had the Midas touch when it came to illegal business. Nicknamed the mob's accountant, he allegedly once boasted that he took the mob and made it bigger than U.S. steel. And at the height of its power, he might have been right. Meyer Lansky was born Maya Sutra Lansky on July the 4th, 1902, in the city of Grodno, Belarus, which back then was a part of the Russian Empire. At the very least, that is the birthday that was written on his immigration records. When his family traveled to America, his parents didn't actually remember his exact date of birth, so it was more of an estimate. Maya's parents were Polish Jews. They experienced a lot of violence and anti-Semitism, so their goal was to leave the Russian Empire and move to the New World. His father went on ahead alone, and in 1911, the rest of the family followed and settled down in Manhattan's Lower East Side. Lansky's life as a petty criminal started when he was a teenager, but it went to the next level in 1918 when he met his future partner, another notorious Jewish mobster named Bugsy Siegel. According to one story, the two became friends one day when Lansky was coming back to school and he saw Siegel in trouble during a fight over a craps game. He intervened on Siegel's behalf, and moments later the police showed up, prompting the two delinquents to run away together. Just a quick heads up from this moment on, Meyer Lansky's career was closely intertwined for decades with that of Bugsy Siegel. We've already covered Siegel here on Biographics, so maybe give that video a watch afterwards if you haven't seen it. So if there are areas we brush over, that is probably because we already went in-depth on them in the Siegel video. Plus, there is a lot more ground to cover here since Lansky went on for another 35 years after Siegel's death. Anyway, the two criminals soon formed the Bugs and Meyer mob, which steadily became one of the most powerful Jewish mobs in Manhattan throughout the 1920s. They handled racketeering, extortion, burglaries, money lending, car theft, gambling, and once prohibition kicked in, bootlegging. Eventually, they turned to killing as well and actually became quite notorious for their bloodthirst as other gangs began making use of their murder for hire services. Bugsy Siegel was usually the one who was at the head of the hit squad, while Lansky preferred the role in the shadows, acting as the brains of the outfit. The profile of the Bugs and Meyer mob grew, but it was Alansky's association with a different man that enabled him to rise through the ranks, ultimately becoming one of the most powerful mobsters in America. That man was Charles Lucky Luciano. Again, we are relying on a bit of mob law here, but it is said that the two met when they were teenagers, when Luciano, who was five years older, tried to extort money from Lansky. The latter, even though he was younger and smaller, did not back down and was getting ready for a fight. However, Luciano admired the Jewish boy for his toughness, and his instinct told him that it would be better to make a friend than a foe out of Meyer Lansky. And 
Boy, was he right. Working together, Luciano and Lansky enacted a revolution within the American mob, one that saw numerous Italian and Jewish factions from all over the country band together in order to maximize their profits and minimize in-house fighting, which was bad for business. This was accomplished by establishing the National Crime Syndicate, where the decisions were made by the Commission, a group that represented the interests of all of the members instead of a single man, commonly referred to as the boss of all bosses. The birth of the commission was an important landmark in the history of the Mafia, one that changed forever how organized crime operated in America. It was mainly the brainchild of Lucky Luciano, who went on to become the commission's first chairman. But Maya Lansky also helped immensely by organizing the meeting where all the mobsters gathered together for the first time to discuss the terms of their new arrangement. The summit occurred between the 13th and the 16th of May 1929, and was known as the Atlantic City Conference. Once it had concluded, it was time to get rid of the old timers, the so called Moustache Peets, who came from the old country and had no intention of relinquishing power to a committee. At the time, there wasn't just one boss of all bosses, but there were actually two men fighting over supremacy in what was known as the Castella Maresi War. One of them was Joe the Boss Masseria, and the other was Salvatore Maranzano. Luciano was actually a lieutenant for Masseria at the time, but he betrayed him and arranged his assassination for Maranzo in order to end the war in April 1931. Then, just a few months later, he also plans the murder of Maranzano, officially ushering in the era of the commission. As far as Maya Lansky was concerned, his mob provided some of the hitmen used in both assassinations. Because the commission was strictly an Italian thing, Lansky could not have an official seat at the table, but unofficially, he became Luciano's right-hand man, and the two of them worked together on most business dealings. After Prohibition ended, the Bugs and Maya mob disbanded as both he and Siegel took on bigger roles independent of each other within the syndicate. Prohibition had been a giant boom for Maya Lansky and his crew as bootlegging was his main moneymaker. But once it came to an end in 1933, he needed a new cash cow, and he found it in gambling. Don't get us wrong, the mob had already been involved with gambling for decades, but until then, nobody really had Lansky's ambition to set up large operations in multiple cities. He started with Florida in the mid-1930s, then expanded to New Orleans. Pretty much every business Lansky got involved with turned to profit, and he had a reputation that his swanky upscale establishments, known as carpet joints, were all legit so gamblers did not have to worry about the tables being rigged when they played at his casinos. The one investment that proved problematic came almost a decade later, and it was the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas. It was the pet project of Lansky's former partner, Bugsy Siegel. While Lansky was busy setting up a gambling empire, Siegel took over operations in Los Angeles and began palling around with Hollywood's rich and famous. From there, Siegel got the inspired idea to build a new hotel and casino on a stretch of mainly undeveloped land in Nevada, which would later become the Vegas Strip. But contrary to myth, it was not the first casino on the strip, so Bugsy Siegel did not invent Las Vegas to spite the popular saying. The one thing that Siegel did do was convince many of his mobster buddies to invest in the Flamingo, including Maya Lansky. Unfortunately for him, Siegel was good at being a criminal, not a builder. The original budget for the construction was around $1.5 million, but it ended up costing over $6 million, mainly due to delays, contractors taking advantage of Siegel's inexperience, and the possibility that the mobster himself was skimming off the top. This landed Siegel in hot water with the mob, and it was only at Maya Lansky's insistence that he was momentarily given a reprieve. Then the Flamingo actually opened, and the inauguration went terribly because the hotel was not finished yet, just the casino, so people went in, gambled, won, and then took their winnings and went someplace else. Again, Siegel's head was on the chopping block, and Lansky had to intervene to save the neck of his former partner. Of course, Lansky's reach was long, but it wasn't endless. He couldn't save Siegel forever, especially as fears were growing inside the mob, not only that Siegel had been stealing from them, but that he was planning on making a run for it to Europe with his girlfriend, Virginia Hill. On the 20th of June, 1947, Bugsy was gunned down in Hill's California home, and although the identity of the shooter remains a mystery, it was almost certainly a mob hit that had been approved by Maya Lansky. Allegedly, less than half an hour after Siegel's death, some of his associates entered the Flamingo and took over the operation. The hotel and casino soon became profitable, and Lansky maintained his interest in it for decades. <laughs> They often say that the enemy of my enemy is my friends, and that concept was truly tested during World War II. The mob might have been a violent organization responsible for countless illegal activities, but it still was nowhere near as bad as the Nazis. Once the United States entered the war against the Axis powers, they sought out support from the Mafia in a unique alliance dubbed Operation Underworld. Basically, it all started when America captured a former French ocean liner dubbed the SS Normandy, renamed it the USS Lafayette, and converted it into a troop ship. 
However, it never saw action as it capsized and sank while sitting in New York's Pier 88 in the winter of 1942. The circumstances were suspicious, and the US government feared that the ship had been sabotaged by Nazi spies and sympathizers. Therefore, the government reached out to an organization that they knew could control the labor unions and maintain order on the waterfront, the Mafia. In March, they reached out to a Genovese lieutenant named Joseph Lanza, and he sent word up the chain of command to Lucky Luciano. By that point, Luciano had been imprisoned, and he was glad to help in exchange for an early release. The authorities agreed to the terms, although Luciano's release also came with a deportation to Italy. Nowadays, it is a matter of historical debate if Operation Underworld was of any actual help to the war effort or not, but there was at least one mobster who was more proactive and took up arms against the Nazis even before America joined the war. That was Meyer Lansky. Since he was Jewish, it's not surprising that Lansky hated the Nazis, and ever since the 1930s, he and his men went around busting up rallies by pro-Nazi organizations such as the Silver Shirts and the German-American Bund. According to some historians, Lansky even did this with the tacit approval of certain New York officials who hated the Nazis but couldn't do anything to stop them legally, so instead they turned to the mob with the understanding that Lansky and his men were free to break arms and legs and crack some skulls but couldn't kill anybody. Lansky himself described how he and his gang busted Busted up one brown shirt rally in Manhattan. The stage was decorated with a swastika and a picture of Hitler. The speakers started ranting. There were only 15 of us, but we went into action. We threw some of them out of the windows. Most of the Nazis panicked and ran out. We chased them and beat them up. We wanted to show them that Jews would not always sit back and accept insults. As successful as Lansky's businesses in the United States were, they didn't quite live up to his vision of a gambling paradise where he and his partners could exercise control over politicians and operate free from the scrutiny of the US government. To fulfill his ambition, Lansky intended to go to Cuba. It's unclear if Lansky always considered the Caribbean country an ideal target or if the opportunity simply presented itself and he immediately recognized the potential. But his dealings in Cuba started in the late 1930s. Earlier in 1933, there had been an uprising in Cuba known as the Sergeant's Revolt. President Harad Machado was overthrown, and he was succeeded by multiple heads of state with very short terms. Most of them didn't actually have any real authorities. Most of the power was in the hands of a colonel named Fulgencio Batista, who had control of Cuba's armed forces. Finally, in 1940, he won the presidential election and became the new president of Cuba. In decades past, the country's capital, Havana, had been a hotspot for the rich and famous coming over from the United States to indulge in gambling and nightlife. Batista wanted to bring that back, so he enlisted the help of several people to get Cuba's entertainment industries back on their feet, and this included Meyer Lansky, who was brought in to help revitalize the casinos because of his reputation of running profitable and respectable upscale carpet joints back in America. Lansky, of course, could spot a good thing when he saw one, so he began cultivating a working relationship with the Cuban leader that would last for decades. At the end of the day, they both shared a vision for what Cuba could become. It looked like Lansky and Batista were going to make a lot of money together, but something unexpected happened in 1944. Batista lost power. It was time for a new election. The colonel did not run again, but he handpicked his successor, fully expecting him to easily win and become the new president, basically acting as a puppet who still carried out Batista's orders. But he actually lost the election, and the new Cuban president, Ramon Grau, didn't share Batista's interest in gambling and neither did his successor. That meant that for eight years, Lansky's plans in Cuba were put on hold. They resumed in 1952 when Batista staged another coup and seized power once more. In between Batista's two times as leader of Cuba, Lansky had no choice but to focus his attention elsewhere. But one notable thing did occur in the country during that time the Havana Conference. It was held during the week of December the 22nd, 1946, at the Hotel Nacional de Cuba. Like the summit from Atlantic City held in 1929, this was a major gathering of all the top mobsters to discuss some pressing matters. It was organized by Lansky and Luciano, and it was held in Cuba so that Luciano could attend after having been deported to Italy. Some of the important topics discussed included the Mafia's role in the drug trade, what they intended to do about Bugsy Siegel, who at the time was having problems with the Flamingo Hotel, and tensions that were brewing in the Luciano family as Vito Genovese was making a play to become the new Don since Lucky couldn't travel to the US anymore. Their role in Cuba was also debated, while many other mobsters shared Lansky's vision. For this, they needed Batista back in power, or at least somebody else willing to open the country up to them. A few years went by, and in 1952, Fulgencio Batista staged a military coup. On paper, he was a provisional president, but in reality, 
He was the new dictator of Cuba, and he was ready to turn Havana into a hedonistic playground for rich tourists, while Meyer Lansky and his lot were tripping over themselves to provide Cuba with all the gambling, drugs, and prostitutes it could ever need. One Cuban historian described Havana during the 1950s as being what Las Vegas would eventually become. For just $50, tourists could fly in from Florida, and the money would be enough to cover their flights, their hotel rooms, and leave enough spending cash so they could entertain themselves at brothels, buffets, beaches, casinos, clubs, and cabarets, which were all a short walk walking distance from each other. On the mob side of things, operations were mainly handled by Meyer Lansky and a man named Santo Traficante Jr. As head of the Traficante crime family based out of Tampa, the latter controlled most criminal activities in Florida, so naturally most shipments that went to and from Cuba passed through his territory. Lansky started by opening a few nightclubs and casinos, such as the Montmartre Club and the Tropicana. He then persuaded Batista to renovate Havana's already iconic Hotel Nacional and turn one of the wings into a casino. The money was pouring in. The Cuban government was incredibly friendly towards foreign investments and showed little concern for the source of this new revenue. As long as they invested enough money, the mob had no trouble acquiring all the licenses they needed and even received tax breaks and public matching funds for construction. The 50s were very profitable for Meyer Lansky and his associates, but he wanted even more. Like his one-time partner Bugsy Siegel, Lansky wanted to leave his mark by building his own hotel and casino the Havana Riviera. Construction began in December 1956, and it finished just a year later. Lansky had spared no expense. The Riviera was the largest and most luxurious casino hotel in Cuba, situated on prime beachfront property that provided every room with a view of the Gulf of Mexico. Every week, there was a new headlining act from Hollywood, while Meyer Lansky used the presidential suite on the top floor as his new headquarters. Lansky had achieved his goal, but it didn't last long. While Havana had been transformed into a garden of earthly delights for American tourists, the rest of Cuba wasn't doing so well. It suffered due to poverty and corruption, and this led to talks of rebellion, which were inflamed by a young firebrand named Fidel Castro, who had begun assembling an army of guerrillas. At first, the mob was not too concerned, believing that it would be business as usual, regardless of who was in charge. But they were wrong. The rebels won on December the 31st, 1958, and the following day, Fulgencio Batista and dozens of his family members and close associates fled Cuba forever. Fidel Castro was now in charge, and he brought communism to Cuba. Within a year, all industries and businesses had been nationalized, and just like that, the mob lost all of its assets and revenue sources in Cuba. Losing Cuba was a big blow to the Mafia, but especially to Meyer Lansky, who had invested so much money into the Riviera. Throughout the 1960s, mobsters kept a lookout for other locations in the Caribbean and the Bahamas, which could potentially become the new Havana. At the same time, it is likely that Lansky and his associates were holding out hope that Castro's regime would fall and be replaced with somebody who was friendlier towards foreign ventures, and it would be back to business like before. Ultimately, all this did not happen, and the mob eventually gave up looking in other places and instead chose to focus its attention on Las Vegas. At that point, the gambling industry had begun to gain a foothold in the city, and Vegas was showing the first glimpses of why it would soon become Sin City. Meyer Lansky's later years were much more quiet. Although he still maintained an important role in organized crime, he also invested in legitimate businesses. His wealth has always been a tricky subject to estimate, and has caused a lot of debate among historians. While some believed he was worth hundreds of millions of dollars at the height of his power, others think this is sheer fantasy. He left almost no money behind when he died, and it's possible that he lost most of his wealth in Cuba. For most of his criminal career, Lansky had managed to avoid getting into trouble with the law, but in 1970 it seemed like he would finally end up behind bars on tax evasion charges. That same year, he tried to move to Israel using the country's law of return, which allowed Jews from other places to relocate there. However, the Israeli government could turn down requests from people with criminal pasts, and it did so in Lansky's case. He fought the decision in Israeli court for over two years, but he eventually lost and was returned to America in 1972. Ultimately, the charges against Lansky were dropped in 1974, with a physician ruling that he was too ill to stand trial. Meyer Lansky spent the last years of his life in his home in Miami Beach, Florida. It is unclear how involved he was in the mob at this point, but it's certain that it was a completely different playing field. All the people that he came up with were either dead or in prison. Lansky himself died of lung cancer on January the 15th, 1983, aged 80. He enjoyed a rare luxury for those in his line of business by getting to die of old age and as a free man. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.